This is the Compiler Explorer website and in this video I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the more advanced features that it provides. If you've watched my previous video you'll know a little bit about Compiler Explorer. It allows you to type code on the left hand side and see how it corresponds to assembly code generated by the compiler on the right hand side. I usually use Compiler Explorer for small self-contained snippets of code. Sometimes though you want to see how other libraries interact with your own code. Compiler Explorer supports many libraries, Boost, um, GSL, Absale, Ranges and all these other ones here and you can make them available to Compiler Explorer by clicking these buttons to select them and make them part of uh, the include search path. So here for example I'm going to pick Boost. So now I can include a Boost header file if I can type properly and we can see how that corresponds to code. Let's write a little test routine we're going to say this takes a const, oops, const std and s, and we're going to return boost lexical cast of int of s, and see what we get from that. Including headers obviously slows down the compilation a little bit. Let's turn the optimizer on. So we get quite a lot of code generated on the right hand side. You'll notice that most of this code is not highlighted. That means it does not correspond to a line in our code on the left hand side. And so this is all the code inside Boost that generates exceptions and things like that. And we're scrolling and we're scrolling and scrolling. Hopefully we'll find some of our own code. In fact, we'll be scrolling a long time before we find code that we wrote. I'm going to actually use a feature over here. So if you right click, you can scroll to the assembly of a particular line. So here we are, now we're into the part of the code, my test routine that takes the standard string. Um, apparently the only part of the code that's attributed to my own code is just this sort of in, in stacking of registers. And then we get to see the all the, the glory of Boost's generated code. Now obviously sifting through this is probably not that useful or interesting, but certainly you can use it to test features in libraries that you don't have installed locally. So you can just select your library from the list and then play around with it um, on the left hand side here. Let's take a look at another feature that Compiler Explorer provides. This is an example which uh, takes two arrays of 65,000 um, elements X and Y and it makes sure that the X value, the ith X value is the max of the either the x i the i x value or the i y value. So we just run through and if one's bigger than the other we switch them around. It corresponds to this loop on the right hand side. Um, you can visualize this in a number of ways. So here we can now add a new pane um, and unfortunately this has gone off slightly off the side of the screen here. So I am going to add the graph output. So I'm going to click and drag and pop this down here and then in fact I will maximize this. This gives us a control flow graph of the code. In this instance, we can see that the code starts here at the ZOR EAX EAX, which sets EAX to zero, heads into this basic block here, which does uh, a move of the input and a comparison with the second input. So this is like reading in XI and comparing it with YI. And then, let me just move these around a bit, hopefully it makes it a bit clearer. Oh. If the condition is false, we fall through to here, which then replaces the XI with the YI element. If it was true, we go down to this bottom block here, or indeed once it's finished with the conditional move of the Y element, we come down to this basic block here, which is the end of the loop header. This adds uh, eight to move to the next element and compares to see whether or not we've reached the end of the 65,000 times eight um, elements here. If not equal, then we're going to jump back up here. So the green arrows indicate the condition being taken. This is a taken branch. And the red means that the branch was not taken. So this is now means we come out to the return that finishes the end of the function itself. So this is another visualization of the same information in the other window, but perhaps a little bit simpler to break down into, into pieces. Another view is the RTL view. So I can bring this out here, and this is only valid for GCC-based compilers. We get to see both the tree 
and all the internal passes of the compiler. So I am not an expert at all at what goes on inside compilers, but we can pick say one of these passes and then we can see the internal representation. Let me again maximize this. We get to see the internal representation of the compiler. What on earth has happened? This, this BB here corresponds to basic blocks. Um, I have no idea other than this, but if you're a compiler developer or if you're interested in what's going on inside the compiler, you can use these um, passes to see what happens to your code as it gets uh, affected by different parts of the compiler. We also have a number of Clang only um, features. So I'm gonna pick Clang now as the compiler. And then I'm gonna add an AST view. The AST view here is literally that. It's the abstract syntax tree of the code. So if you're interested in how the parser has interpreted your code, you can use this view and with a bit of extra work, fathom what on earth is going on inside the uh, the parser to to understand like how, how um, your code has been interpreted by the compiler. There's also the opt view let me just move this back and we have the clang optimization view and i will put this at the bottom in this case this shows the code again except it, an it is annotated with these bars on the right hand side and so clang as it's going can actually emit information about how the optimization process went so this top yellow area that i've just moused over here says that the these are just analysis um so zero stack bytes in function we didn't use any local variables 13 instructions in function apparently. If we then look on these red things, um, we can see that there are some warnings from the optimization system. The optimization system has said that vectorization is not beneficial. In this instance, I believe this is because we're only on O2, and so the cost of vectorizing is deemed too high. On this other line, you can see some other interesting um, aspects. I don't, again, I'm not an expert in how Clang does its optimizations internally, but they, these things may be useful if you are, either are or wish to learn. Let's put this onto O3 and see how that changes. So I was wrong. Um, it wasn't the optimization level. It's just that Clang really doesn't think this is worth vectorizing. Very interesting. Let me see if I tell it that we're on a sandy bridge. The compiler is now using these vmov uh, instructions, which are using the XMM registers. Still, there are some things that are missing here. List vectorization was possible, but not beneficial. That's fascinating. I don't really know what's going on here, but it's interesting nonetheless. But a lot of code has been generated now. Crikey. So that's the optimization viewer. So something else we can do is we can actually bring in a new editor, a whole new editor. So this is a C++ editor with the max array function written in it. I'm going to bring down a whole new editor here and zoom in it a bit. And then I'm going to compare at the risk of starting a flame war. I'm going to compare Rust. And I know this has a max array. And these are both the unoptimized versions of it. So they're both sort of the idiomatic uh, version. So on the top here, I have the C++ code that maxes over an array. On the bottom, I have the equivalent code in Rust. Now this is scrolling off the side of the screen slightly. Now there is no compiler compiling this currently, so I need to add one. So I'm going to come down to here and I'm going to pick add new compiler and drag it over here. So on top we have the, the C++ code and the C++ output. On the bottom we have the Rust code and the Rust output. Now I'm going to be make, to make this a somewhat fair fight, I'm going to do uh, minus O puts just normal optimization and I will put normal, as I say normal, O2 optimization on the top. So this should be a somewhat fair comparison. We've generated code that looks like this in the top window, and the Rust code has, if anything, generated cleaner, nicer looking code in, in my view. It seems that the implementation of the max array function here is not quite equivalent to the C. We are here unconditionally writing either uh, X or Y to XI, which explains most of the differences. And again, we can use the difference view to see what's actually going on there. Sometimes it's useful to see whether or not a particular feature is supported in a compiler. So for example, 
um, if I wanted to test a C++ 17 feature, let's say if in it So here we've got a somewhat made up example where we call some external function which returns an integer and if that integer is greater than 100 we return it here if not we return 0 so this uses the if in it where this variable x is only valid inside this if statement and we both initialize it with func and then compare it with 100 in the same line this is a cool new feature in C++17 but which compilers support it we could manually go through all of the compilers here in the drop-down, and that would be completely reasonable. But we can also use this conformance view here. So I'm going to create myself a conformance view. Here I can add a number of compilers, including GCC 7.3. I'm going to give it standard equals 17. And we can see that this green indicator says that the code up here currently compiles without any issues on GCC 7.3. Let's try GCC 6. Well, it doesn't compile by default. Let's make sure that we've got standard plus equals C++ 17. And no, it still doesn't compile. So now we know this feature isn't supported in GCC 6.3. What about Clang? Here we get a warning which tells us that it is a C17 extension, so let's give it the command line flag that it needs. And Clang 5 supports it just fine. How about Clang 4? Clang 4 doesn't understand C17, so let's just change that to 1z. And indeed, Clang 4 also supports the if in it. Now, of course, this has taken us a while to test, but now we've got these lined up, we can do all sorts of other tests up here and keep an up, a live update of whether or not the compilers down the bottom support the features that we're interested in. We don't need the assembly for this. So let's try map in place. And here you can see that all the compilers, except for Clang 4, support the try in place. Compiler Explorer supports a number of settings. So here, on the more settings, you can change your default language. Uh, if you hit Compiler Explorer at language.godbolt.org, so for example, haskell.godbolt.org, you will get that compiler as a default but if you just hit the plain godbolt.org this configuration option here chooses which compiler you're going to see sorry which language you're going to see there's a number of other selections here that you can pick to, to your taste um, the delay between compilation can be changed and whether or not the compiler automatically builds uh, the website automatically compiles your code when you stop typing at all is here if if you do disable this, then you can always hit Control Enter to compile whatever you've typed in so far. And in fact, Control Shift Enter toggles whether or not this setting is on. So if you're doing a presentation and the error messages are getting annoying, you can always hit Control Shift Enter to disable the compilers you type. You can change whether or not the highlighting happens and whether or not they're the minimap, which is the uh, the pane. Uh, this, this part here, this little part, both here and here, which is on, not necessarily that useful on smaller snippets of code. You can choose how the colorization looks. So um, there are two settings, Rainbow and Rainbow 2 here, that are just um, Cynthia uh, Brewer's awesome color um, choices. So looks quite different with the uh, Rainbow 2. Perhaps more importantly, if you are if you suffer from color blindness, then there are two color blind safe um, color schemes that you can pick that um, will hopefully make it a lot easier for you to see what's going on. Finally, you can change the theme of the whole UI. 
and so if uh, it's too white and glaring for you you can pick the dark theme and then you get this rather sort of more sinister looking version of Compiler Explorer. I'm on the light side though so I'm going to leave it on the default. Once you've written your amazing routine that you want to share with others, so here is a kind of somewhat hint, heavily hinted version of the accumulate function, um, you can share it with others. Up here, there's a share link. And so you can copy this short URL and paste it into Twitter or Facebook or wherever. Um, it encodes the code and the layout of the screen. So if you've added other editors or diff views or you've resized things, then that should also be part of the URL that you're sharing. You can choose the type of link here. By default, it is a short URL, but you can pick a full URL where the, in the entire state of the application is in a very, very long URL. This does cause problems sometimes. The encoding format um, can be very, very verbose. So do be aware of this. You can also pick an embed view. This will generate a little HTML snippet that you can paste into a website. And then you can see a little embedded version of Compiler Explorer, which is live editable in this case, or if you pick the read only, it's not editable at all. Um, this allows you to put your example onto your own website. For example, somewhere down here, this is my website. And here you can see that there's an embedded version of Compiler Explorer here. Um, you can see I'm multiplying by seven over here and there's the, the code I showed in an earlier video in fact on this right hand side and there's always a little link out here to come edit it back on Compiler Explorer. Finally on the other tab here you can see there's a number of other choices you can help support Compiler Explorer by becoming a patron on the Patreon site where you can give a small donation small recurring monthly donation to help with the costs of running the servers and um, the, the, the services that I use to provide Compiler Explorer. Of course, you can look at the source code. The source code is open source. Um, I very much encourage you to take a look at the code, run a local instance of Compiler Explorer yourself. There are instructions on how to do that if you um, wish to. And please contribute. If you have ideas or thoughts, then, then um, raise an issue on the bug tracker or start hacking on some code. Um, there is a mailing list, so you can join there. There's a list of installed libraries. Um, you can see the wiki, um, report an issue. Some of the Patreons um, have given a donation large enough for me to put them on this big list. Huge thanks to them. Um, there's a, an article on how it works behind the scenes. Obviously, you can contact me and you can tweet about it too. So that's about it. In these two videos, we've gone over all of the functionality that Compiler Explorer has. Hopefully it's been useful to you. Hopefully you've learned something. Uh, please like the video if you enjoyed it and subscribe for more technical videos like this on a variety of subjects ranging from microarchitecture on CPUs through to library use through compilers uh, and optimizations.